During the past 100 plus years, thousands of people have attempted to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Most have been experienced climbers who attempted the climb as part of a team using supplemental oxygen and following the instructions of an even more experienced guide. Still, there have been many others who preferred to go at it alone without any help of any kind. And for them, the expedition typically does not end well. Even those who make it to the top alone often die during descent. The first person to successfully make a solo climb of Mount Everest was Reinhold Messner, one of the greatest mountaineers of all time, and it didn't happen until 1980, 27 years after Edmund Hillary became the first confirmed person to reach the summit. However, 56 years before Messner's achievement, there was a man who made one of the most insane attempts to reach the summit of Everest in the history of the mountain. His name was Maurice Wilson, and his original plan was to crash land a plane on Everest, then walk to the top. There were many problems with this plan, but the main one? He knew nothing about mountaineering or flying an airplane. Good evening, my fellow citizens. We will be able to work together, to pray together. If the Japanese insist on continuing resistance, their country will suffer the same destruction as Germany. Timothy McVeigh was arrested by local authorities. Eight climbers dead. Maurice Wilson was born in Bradford, West Yorkshire on April 21st, 1898 and may have lived a normal, quiet life working in the mill with his father had it not been for the outbreak of the Great War, now known as World War I in 1914. Wilson joined the British Army when he turned 18 in 1916 as a commissioned officer and quickly rose through the ranks. He became a war hero when he single-handedly held a machine gun post against approaching Germans after the rest of his unit had been killed or injured. He was awarded the Military Cross with the citation reading Second Lieutenant Maurice Wilson for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. He held a post in advance of the line under very heavy shell and machine gun fire on both flanks after the machine guns covering his flanks had been withdrawn. It was largely owing to his pluck and determination in holding this post that the enemy attack was held up. He was later wounded by machine gun fire and sent home. His left arm caused him pain for the rest of his life, but his attempts to receive compensation for himself and for his brother who suffered from severe PTSD were denied. After his discharge from the military, Wilson had trouble readjusting to civilian life. He became restless and felt a need for excitement and adventure. In 1921, the financial means to achieve this became a possibility when his father died and left him his estate, valued at around $1 million. The next year, he married a woman named Beatrice, but married life never satisfied Wilson, and he began to travel the world looking for new adventures, leaving his wife, jobs, and other responsibilities behind. It was during 1932 when he read about the famous 1924 British Everest expedition in which a team of climbers attempted to reach the summit of Mount Everest. The two climbers who were determined the strongest during that climb, George Mallory and Sandy Irvine, made a final push towards the summit, but never made it off the mountain alive to tell the story of whether they'd made it or not. By 1932, there was still no proof that any human being had ever reached the summit. Maurice Wilson was captivated by the amazing story of Mallory and Irvine, and he decided that he would be the first confirmed man to reach the summit of Mount Everest, despite having zero experience as a mountaineer. The best way to go about such an ambitious goal would have been to get into top physical condition by climbing smaller mountains with hopes of eventually joining the Alpine Club and becoming a part of a future British expedition to Everest. Instead, Wilson decided that he was going to reach the summit of Mount Everest completely alone without any assistance of any kind. To put this into perspective, there had already been three massive expeditions that included teams of dozens of trained and expert mountaineers along with hundreds of locals called Sherpas to assist them. And Everest remained undefeated. Even in modern times, with modern equipment, radios, and known routes, some of the most elite climbers in the world have died attempting to summit Everest alone. 
Wilson's original idea, the most insane idea in the history of mountaineering, which is quite a declaration, was to crash a plane near the top of the mountain, then simply climb to the summit from there. Problem number one, he had never flown a plane. Flying a plane solo halfway around the world would have been a great achievement on its own without climbing the highest mountain in the world. Number two, even if he survived this crash and successfully parachuted himself onto the mountain safely, he would quickly lose consciousness from oxygen deprivation and die shortly thereafter. The body needs to slowly acclimatize to the altitude, which is why Everest climbers slowly climb up, then down the mountain, gradually moving higher, returning to base camp to rest multiple times before making a final assault on the summit. Nevertheless, Wilson began to take flying lessons and eventually purchased a two-seat DH-60 Gypsy Moth airplane. He called the plane Everest. And after a couple of months of flying lessons, he was able to fly it by himself. However, according to his peers and instructors, Wilson was not a good pilot and a relatively slow learner. It took him twice as long as the average pilot in training to earn his flying license. They begged him to reconsider his plans, but he was resolute. Wilson was putting his plan into motion and even flew to his mother's home to say goodbye to her in case he perished on the mountain. As insane as his plan was, he did come to realize that he had to bring supplementary oxygen in order to not immediately pass out, and he planned to bring along 750 liters of O2. He was also a strong believer in prayer and fasting, and thought that with his advanced spiritual awareness, he could survive through what previous climbers could not. Unsurprisingly, he was heavily criticized by the members of the Elite Alpine Club, who believed that he was treating the ultimate challenge of reaching the summit of the world's tallest mountain with complete disrespect. However, the media covered Wilson's story, sometimes mocking him, but he reveled in the attention. What made Wilson's attempt even more insane, if that's possible, is that he never really trained to become a mountaineer. He knew nothing about basic rock climbing, using ropes, crampons, an ice axe. He never even practiced climbing mountains in the snow. The level of insanity in this attempt cannot be overstated. It would be comparable to someone who just learned how to tread water attempting to swim across the Atlantic. He planned to depart for Tibet in April of 1933, but crashed into a field during his final test flight, which caused damage to the plane and the Everest attempt had to be postponed. Somehow, Wilson was uninjured. The following month, on May 21st, 1933, after his plane was repaired, Maurice Wilson took off on the adventure of a lifetime, making the first leg of his journey from London to Freiburg, Germany. From there, getting to Mount Everest, whether in Tibet or Nepal, would be a monumental task. Wilson would have to fly through clouds and severe weather for the first time constantly alter his route as he did not have the proper permits to fly over several countries and he did not even have the backing of his own government to make this flight. Still, he was making national headlines in England during a time when pilots who were attempting to break barriers and test boundaries were the superheroes of the day. Wilson kept pushing forward and made it to Cairo, then Baghdad. From there, he planned to fly over Persia towards Nepal, but he was denied by Persia. Instead, he headed towards Bahrain, using a children's atlas to guide him, low on fuel through scorching temperatures. Against all odds, he made it to Bahrain, but was grounded there. The British government requested that Bahrain not refuel him unless he agreed to return to Baghdad on his way back to London. This was not only because they did not believe in his mission, but because his plane did not have the fuel capacity that would guarantee him to reach his next eastern destination, which would have to be India since Persia would not allow him. Wilson promised that he would return to London, but as soon as he was in the air, he headed towards India. And somehow, flying only by compass, he made it, completely on fumes, arriving with the fuel gauge on empty. From there, the challenges continued as Nepal informed him that he would not be allowed to fly his plane into Nepalese airspace nor enter on foot in order to climb Mount Everest. To no one's surprise, this did not deter Wilson. He was forced to abandon the airplane idea and decided to attempt to climb the mountain completely on foot from the Tibet side of the mountain. To his dismay, 
the Tibetan government also forbid him from entering their country. At this point, he would have to get creative. Wilson spent the winter in Darjeeling, India, where he met three Sherpas who had recently attempted to climb Mount Everest during the unsuccessful 1933 British expedition. On March 21st, 1934, the four men left Darjeeling disguised as monks, entering Tibet heading straight for Everest. Wilson pretended to be deaf, dumb, and in very poor health in order to avoid suspicion. After a grueling 24-day trek, they reached the Rongbuk Monastery near the base of the north side of Everest. Regardless of how insane his plan was, the fact that Wilson had gotten this far is a testament to his staunch determination and willpower. He was able to obtain some of the equipment left behind by the 1933 expedition and after only two days at the monastery, set off by himself without the Sherpas towards Everest. We know what happened next because Wilson kept a diary in which he recorded the events that occurred as he attempted to do completely alone as a newbie amateur mountaineer, something that not even a complete team of experts could do after four massive expeditions funded by an entire country. Scale the tallest mountain in the world. Not surprisingly, things did not go smoothly. The man who had never stepped foot on a glacier in his life struggled to get through the challenging Rongbu Glacier. He came across an abandoned camp and found some crampons, which would have helped him immensely, but he foolishly threw them aside and left them. After five days, the harsh and unforgiving climate of Everest had defeated Wilson and he returned to the monastery, never having made it as far as Camp 3. At this point, he had a twisted ankle, was snow blind, and his war injuries were causing him immense pain. But he was alive and made it off the mountain. He could have given up here and been proud of his effort and the fact that he made it as far as he had. Instead, after 18 days of recovery, Wilson tried again, but this time he brought along two of the Sherpas. With their assistance, Wilson made it to Camp 3 in just three days. From there, he set off alone towards Camp 4, hoping that the steps cut into the ice and ropes would still be in place from previous expeditions. In his diary, he wrote, Not taking shortcut to Camp 5 as first intended. I should have to cut my own road up the ice, and that's no good when there's already a hand rope and steps, if still there, to Camp 4. Of course, he was disappointed to find no trace of previously cut steps or ropes, which is not surprising. The following day, he was forced to turn around short of the North Coal when he ran into a 40-foot tall ice wall that was impossible to climb. The two Sherpas informed him that the attempt was over. They had to turn back. Wilson refused. He had come this far and he was not ready to give up. They begged and pleaded, turn around, come with us. Wilson refused. In his diary, he wrote, this will be a last effort and I feel successful. Without a doubt, Wilson had made it further than he ever should have, especially in the 1930s before any human had been confirmed to have made it to the summit of Everest. The fact that he survived up to this point and nearly made it to the North Pole was nothing short of a miracle. He had the chance now to survive this insane journey and earn massive respect for chasing a wild dream and making it so far while still having the wisdom to understand when it was time to turn back. Instead, Wilson left alone towards the North Pole on May 29th while the two Sherpas awaited his return. After about 10 days, they descended and waited at the monastery for three weeks until it became obvious. Maurice Wilson had pushed his luck too far. He had died on Mount Everest. About a year later, in 1935, Mountaineer Eric Shipton was on a reconnaissance mission when he came across Wilson's body at the foot of the North Pole, lying on its side with a rucksack nearby containing his diary and a Union Jack flag that he planned to leave on the summit. Wilson was buried in a nearby crevasse, but even in death, he refuses to stay down, and his mummified body has resurfaced multiple times over the years, most recently in 1999. There have been many ambitious climbers who have gone on what can only be considered suicide missions. Take David Sharp, who tried to climb Everest alone with the bare minimum equipment and no radio. Or Nobukazu Kuriki, who kept trying to climb the mountain even after losing nine fingers, looking for the most challenging routes despite never reaching the summit with traditional routes. These climbers did have one thing in common, however. 
They were attempting something that had been done before and had the slightest idea of what they were doing as they had conquered other high altitude mountains and could call themselves mountaineers. Maurice Wilson, on the other hand, had no mountaineering experience and was attempting something that had never been done before, not even by the most elite mountaineers in the world. Was he a complete lunatic suffering from mental illness and PTSD who just lucked out to get as far as he did? Or is he a heroic and inspiring example of what someone can achieve if they never give up on their dreams? He may have never made it to the summit, but for a non-pilot, non-mountaineer to take some flying lessons, acquire a plane, fly to India, trek into Tibet, hire some Sherpa, and make it to the foot of the North Pole in 1934 is quite impressive, albeit also completely insane. Thank you so much for checking out today's video. Please subscribe to the channel for more videos on not only mountaineers, but also space exploration, true crime, and much more stuff that happened. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Let me know your thoughts on this incredibly ambitious but troubled man, and we will talk to you in the next video.